Hello, everybody, and welcome to the now 17th episode of the Bad Motor GP show. We are reviewing Aragon. We have a few interesting topics. Of course, the race uh, where Bastianini uh, won against uh, Pekka Banyaya in the last lap, the uh, collision of Fabio and Marc Marquez, and also Marc Marquez's comeback in general. And uh, yeah, Aleix was back on the podium. Brad Binder somehow put the KTM into the top five. And Alex Rins had a great comeback from last place after the incident uh, between Marcus and Fabio. And also in Moto2, we have uh, Lord Pedro striking again, coming back from the injury with a big win. And uh, yeah, the championship battle between Ayogura and uh, Augusto Fernandez gets more and more intense. So we will discuss this and also Moto3, the championship battle. The pendulum seems to swing a little bit uh, towards Isan Guevara. And we will discuss all of this and his great race and also several David Munoz attempted murder cases. So stay tuned and uh, we will discuss all of it and many more since uh, we will just go down a couple of rabbit holes. And yeah, so basically, Keelan, you enjoyed the races. Was everything fine? Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with your regularly scheduled Bad Moto GP programming. Great to be back two weekends in a row. And Aragon did not disappoint. Once again, Leo, I had a brilliant, brilliant time this weekend. All three days, great action across all three classes. The races delivered as we thought they would. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, before we even get into today's scheduled programming, I got to give a shout out to Leo, Mystic Memes. You want to know who called the race, the MotoGP race? This man did. He called it on Twitter, on Instagram, on all of your social media platforms. He called it to the T. So first of all, Leo, give yourself a round of applause before we get into everything, because to be fair, you called it Bastianini last lap managed the tires and bang it happened so yes to answer your question i had a brilliant weekend it delivered as i thought i would and i'm very excited to get into de- today's episode yeah i mean when was the last time that you would say moto 3 was the least entertaining race of the three classes i mean that's exactly a- it's amazing and yeah so let's dive right into what the man behind on the uh, background peko banyaya he had an incredible ba- uh, battle with uh, Emea Bastianini, like in Misano, but this time uh, Emea Bastianini managed to overtake him. And basically, as I predicted, uh, as the race went on, Emea Bastianini was the best at uh, managing his rear tire. He had the pace to close the gap to Peko and to overtake him. And uh, yeah, I was a little bit surprised because um, usually Enea Bastianini is much better than everybody else and this time it seemed like okay he had the overtake in the middle of the race made a mistake had to recover all of this maybe he used a little bit more of his tire than he would like to but I would have expected that Enea Bastianini pulled away like in the last five or six laps but yeah we were treated with the last lap showdown so I won't complain and it's uh, it sends a message especially for next year that um that Enea Bastianini is not here to play uh, to play the support act like Jack Miller does to Pekka He's here to win. And he costed uh, Pekka five valuable championship points. Who uh, would have thought? I mean, Ducati team orders aren't in place, obviously, now. But uh, yeah, he's there to win, and I'm here for it. I love every, every single thing about this man. Yeah, I mean... If Ducati are going to be anywhere near like this in 2023, then the rest of the grid are in real trouble. Absolutely. Enea Bastianini, what a fantastic win from him. What a mature and level performance from Bastianini as well. A lot of younger riders would have rushed into that red-blooded and something could have happened. You know, it could have been like a few years ago with Andrea Iannone and Davizioso where they potentially both crash out. Brilliant, brilliant race. Very good overtake from Bastianini. And all around, Ducati will be delighted with how both Bastianini and Bagnaia are doing. Peko did a great job managing the race, got out in front, rode his race up until the last lap, and Bastianini stuck with him really, really well. 
like you said, like we said in the intro, managed the tires brilliantly, was able to get that overtake in, and then just held on to the lead really well. It would seem to me Ducati have, for once, made a master stroke in moving Bastianini up to the factory team, because those two were five seconds ahead of anybody else. Uh, well, they were ahead, five seconds ahead of Alicia Spargo in third. And if those two are anything like this form next season, then they could whitewash the entire grid between them. They really, really could. So all round brilliant weekend for Ducati and Davide Tardazzi et al. will be delighted. Yeah, I mean, the key part for Enea Bastianini this season is that he figured out qualifying. He was mm -hmm. great at the managing his tires even last year when he had the incredible comebacks at Misano. But this year, it was always like, okay, at the beginning especially, okay, Bastianini can do things towards the end of the race, but he's usually too far away. I mean, he had the win in Qatar, he had it in Le Mans and uh, in Austin. But apart from that, he wasn't really a front runner. And now for the last three races, he figured out qualifying. I can't remember if you qualified on the first row in Misano, but in Aus Austria, he was for sure on pole. And now he was uh, third on the front row. So Misano was also good, but I don't remember if it was first or second row. But this is the key to Enea Vestinini's success, because if he's on top in qualifying or in the first two rows, he can win every single race because he's that good. And uh, I mean, in Austria, he was a bit unlucky. He would... would uh, who would have doubted that he would uh, consider battling with Peko towards the end? I mean, he isn't afraid of him. So, yeah, I'm I'm very uh, excited, especially for next year. But we have a championship to decide this year, which got a whole lot more interesting. Because even though Peko was brilliant but lost, he still won. He yeah. ended, gained 20 points uh, to Fabio. He was very mature. I mean, Bastianini overtook him. He was like, go have fun with the victory. I will take second place. I won't do anything stupid because he was already on the limit and he knew that he simply couldn't crash in this situation. So hats off to Peckle, who still won big time. And I guess we have to uh, dive into the whole Mark Marcus and uh, Fabio thing because as soon as Mark Marcus is back, carnage occurred which is always like a good or a bad thing, but there's always carnage. And yeah, what did you make out of the incident? Oh boy, we are about to kick the hornet's nest here. Um, yeah, I mean, Mark Marquez is back for one lap of one race and he's already influenced in the title race in a negative way. Um, in many ways, I've missed the excitement. In many ways, I have not. But we'll get into it here now. Um. I have to say, I never thought I'd actually be in this position, but I do actually feel very slightly sorry for Mark Marquez. Yes, I said it. Um, oh, God, people are going to turn on me now. Um, no, I mean, for once, it wasn't actually Mark's doing as such. Um, it was a, I think it was a cold front tire, and his bike understeered and kicked out in front of him. And unfortunately, Fabio was having to ride on the limit from the first from the start in order to make up the power deficit. Unfortunately, that landed Fabio right behind Mark. Mark had to break very slightly. Fabio took the consequences. And most of all, thank God, Fabio's actually all right. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily blame Mark for that. I think that was a racing incident. I, th I think with Mark, there's not much he could have done there because he was trying to get control of his bike back because of the cold tire. And then with Taka Nakagami, I think it's something fairly similar. The bike kicks out again. Unfortunately, Nakagami's right beside him. He bears the consequences of it. But for once, I don't actually think I can blame Mark for it. I don't think it's um I don't think it's a case of Marquez recklessness. I think it's more severely being unfortunate for everybody involved. I mean, with Fabio, his race is out before he even has a chance to influence it. Nakagami likely misses Japan, his home race, the first one in three years. But for Mark, um, in all fairness and transparency, I can't overly say that I blame him because I do think he tried to avoid it. And at the very least, I don't think he meant for it to happen. 
But either way, um, life is always interesting when Mark Marquez is around. One lap has already shown that, and God only knows what the rest of the season holds. Yeah, I mean, for me, the Mark Marquez comeback in Aragon was always like, uh, I don't see the whole truth, because mm -hmm. when you consider his injury, he always had problems in right turns. And Aragon is an anti-clockwise uh, circuit. That's why he was so good in the past there. And that's why he was able to battle with Peko uh, last year there. So I always uh, thought, okay, let's see where Mark is. Let's uh, look how his physical condition, but I expected him to, to, to do better than his base level would be because of the uh, nature of the circuit. Yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't see it because uh, of the incident. And uh, yeah, regarding the incident, uh, I don't blame Mark Marcus, but for me, there is one person or one somebody to blame, which is Yamaha. Because Fabio should have never been in this position to start. Where did he start sick? And yeah. he was losing four tenths or three tenths, uh, something like this, in the last sec in the last sector. And on his fastest lap, he was he wasn't even faster through the first three sectors than Pekwanyaya. And I mean, how do what do you want from him? He is by far the best rider on in the world right now. And the what he does on the on the motorcycle is by far as impressive as I as I've ever seen somebody do it. I mean, it's Mark Marquez S on the Honda before his injury. It's Valentino Rossi S. It's Jorge Lorenzo. You know, he's up there because he's this good. But he is constantly held back by the Yamaha and put in difficult situations because he should have never been there. And watching the race, I mean, Peko wasn't in this situation. In the Abbasinini wasn't in this situation. Jack Miller wasn't in this situation. It was Fabio because he had a bad starting position. And this is just bad things that can happen in the first lap. I mean, I don't blame Mark at all. I don't blame Fabio at all. I just blame Yamaha that Fabio has to be in this position. And uh, yeah, the way I saw it, um, Mark was a little bit um, wide in the... Third corner? Yeah. Yeah, turn three. Yeah, it's the uh, double right hander. And the first one is like uh, right after the turn one. And then it uh, not really opens and, and then closes back down. So, but yeah, turn three. He was a little bit wide. And I believe he tried to uh, not lose too many positions where he was a little bit too aggressive on the gas. But and then uh, the rear came, he shut the gas, and then uh yeah and then he his his rear kind of slipped and yeah Fabio was there nothing he could do and um from my understanding something in the rear right hand device uh from Mark Marcus um there was a part of Fabio's bike stuck in there so when he opened the throttle in what was it turn seven before the reverse corkscrew where the Takanakagami incident was, um, there was uh, like that his bike leaned towards the right and he had just uh, collided with uh, Taka, which is again very unfortunate. But if your bike is broken, you can't do anything about it. It is what it is. And it's really unfortunate. By the way, shout out to all the riders who managed to avoid uh, Takanakagami. Uh, he was sliding right over the track and it was incredibly dangerous and like Maverick Vinales, Augusto, no, not Augusto Fernandez, that's ne next year. <laughs> next year. <laughs> um, yeah, and all the riders down uh, down the pecking order, they uh, made, had a great, great uh, reaction time. So appreciate it that we don't have a, a worse injury there. Yeah, for Taka, if he really has to miss his home GP since it's the first one in three years. But uh, yeah, I don't see any fault there. And it's just bad luck. Yeah, it is. And look, really, if you absolutely have to blame someone, you are right. The only person you can really point the finger at is Yamaha for quarter hour having to push beyond the limits of his bike. I mean, this is a discussion I think we've had nearly every episode of the 17 that we've done. 
Now, what I will say is if you believe in the mid-season testing, they believe they find a lot more speed on the 2023 spec M1. So hopefully next season things are a lot better. But we have to judge it in this season and where we are now. We can't judge it in the future. We can only judge it in the present. Um, look, there's nobody at fault there. You are right. Uh, Fabio's having to push the envelope. He's pushing beyond the limits of what his bike's capable of just to stay in touch with the leaders. I mean, that tells you it all. Mark's unfortunate. It's a cold tire. They collide. Then his rear height device is screwed. Uh, it messes up when he tries to accelerate. He hits Taka. And thank God Taka is all right because that absolutely could have been a much worse injury than it was. All around, I'm just thankful that everybody's okay and that not that Tack is injured because, I've, of course, I don't want anybody to be injured. But thankfully, his that's all that he suffered and that everybody at least lives to fight another day. But hopefully with next year, we won't see these scenarios where Fabio has to push the envelope from the very beginning. If they do have that top speed, it will be great to see. But yeah. And as for Mark, his focus isn't this season. His focus is next season. That's the only reason he's back here. Like you said, because Aragon's a clockwise tra- or a counterclockwise track, and it's a track he's done so brilliantly on throughout his history, that's the only reason he's here. He's not here to fight for the title or fight for the win. He's here to get match fitness for next year. So all around, it is what it is, really. And I suppose we move on. Yeah, and now with the 2023 grid confirmed, we uh, always had this fear of Mark Marcus missing the entire season and Honda having three new riders in the garage. I mean, Takanakagami is staying, which is a positive sign for Honda to have some consistency. And also Mark Marcus putting himself and uh, his body in danger um, to collect some data towards um, the end of the season to start next season a little bit prepared. Um, is is good for Honda. I mean, today showed that Mark Marcus could have high sided in turn three. I mean, if he didn't close the throttle or if if anything was a little bit more uh, there, he could have high sided and that could have been the end of his career. So that's the risk he's taken. And shout out to him to do it because his desire to win the championship next season is greater, I believe, than ever because now he finally has hope that it, it's working. And um, I thought he wouldn't race the overseas races, but here we are, he proved me wrong. And in a weird way, I believe it's not bad for Marcus that this happens, because when everybody knows this ever uh, worked out before, when you didn't work out for a long period of time and Mark Marcus didn't roll the MotoGP bike up, uh, um, uh, for like 100 days, it's like more than three months, so if you haven't exercised for a while and you do it full blast, then again, you're totally sore. But if you ease into it, you're not as sore. So after a hard race weekend, I mean, he went from two days of testing where he could manage his uh, workload as he wanted to, to a race weekend where he had the schedule, but without the race, which is undoubtedly the hardest part of the race. Now to go to uh, Japan a week after and have hopefully a full race there is in a weird way kind of good for Marcus that it happened because imagine he uh, raced the race and he wouldn't uh, give up. That's not how he's built. And he's totally sore. His muscles are uh, extremely tight and everything. And then he adds to go to Japan. It's not a perfect scenario. And since he hasn't anything to win, it's kind of a good scenario for him, I would assume. So he's probably not happy that he couldn't uh, race in front of his fans. He's probably not happy that he had to end his debut in this way. But the bigger picture isn't bad for Mark Marcus. That's all I'm trying to say. Uh, it's much worse for Fabio because his championship uh, gets a little bit more difficult. And uh, yeah, when we look at the beginning of the season where he made those points uh, and where he gained all the points over Pekka Banyaya, he was good at qualifying. For example, Catalonia, he was on the, uh, I believe he was on the front row, but he had a good qualifying. And in turn one, he was leading. In uh, Germany, in turn one, he was leading. That's how you win a race with the Yamaha. And this is 
nowadays impossible because Ducati figured the GP22 out. They have those new dinosaur wings and um, they are basically unbeatable in qualifying. I can't remember the last time a Ducati wasn't on pole. If you know it, help me out. I can't remember. Um, I would assume it was before the summer break uh, with Fabio in Germany. That would be my guess, but I don't remember. It's It's been a while. Yeah, it's been too long. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Fabio is in a bad spot. The only positive, again, is that we are heading to the overseas races where nobody had uh, collected data over the last two years. So it will be a complete wildcard. Crazy shit can happen. Let's imagine it's a rain race. Everything can happen there, you know? So um, I'm excited for this. I'm not excited for getting up at uh, 4 a.m. to watch the races. But, uh, yeah. The only thing I will say, Leo, is that we're fight fans. We're used to getting up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. You know the feeling, and most other people probably do as well. Uh, yeah, I don't enjoy it, but I will do it for the culture and for the racing. Um, we'll do what we do. Oh. But, yeah, you make an excellent point, actually. Um, I think the one thing that could save Fabio's title retention campaign are these wildcard overseas races, because we're going to races where I don't think any of these riders have ridden them at the senior level. We're going to Japan, we're going to Phillip Island, we're going to, I think, Thailand as well. Uh, so we're going to races where these riders have not ridden these bikes before. There is no data for these bikes, and it means we have a completely level playing field. And I'm not saying Fabio necessarily has to win at them, but if he can get good podiums on them, he still has a chance of keeping this title. The problem is, you're absolutely correct in what you said, this Ducati, the one that you can literally see on the screen right now, this GP22 qualifies so well that Fabio's getting locked out of the grid now every single week because there's at least two or three Ducatis on the front row completely blocking him from getting forward. So realistically, these next few weeks will be a very good opportunity for Fabio, but he's got to take advantage of them because on these European circuits, I think the Ducatis haven't beat at least until next year. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I never watch the fights live. I always uh, watch them the day after. So well, you're smarter than I am. <laughs> no, I sleep in and then watch them. And uh, yeah, regarding the overseas races, I beg to differ, but Fabio has to win. He has a 10-point lead over Peko, 17 points over um, over Aleish. And if Peko continues the way he does and finishes also on the podium and wins race, Fabio has to beat him at some point. He lost the luxury of uh, being content with uh, taking second places or third places because he now doesn't have a 30-point gap anymore. It's 10 points. If uh, here if Pekka wins in uh, Japan and Fabio finished third, they're basically equal in points. So Fabio has to win. He has to beat Pekka if he wants to win the championship. And uh, yeah, regarding the Ducatis, I don't see it, but it's not only the problem that they qualify so well, but you can't overtake anymore because of the uh, rear right eye devices. We discussed this all of it. And the uh, incident with Marcus today showed again why rear right eye devices should be banned, in my opinion, from uh, next season onwards. But uh, unfortunately, that's not my decision. And unfortunately, it's Dorna's uh, decision and the manufacturer's decision. And I understand the manufacturers that they want, don't want to waste all the money they put into the development, but I don't understand the owner, but nobody does. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Fabio has to win in the overseas races. Otherwise, uh, Pekka will be crowned world champion. And who would have thought? He was 90 points behind at the beginning of the uh, second half of the season. And back then, I always uh, thought to myself, like, I mean, if you can gain 90 points in half a season, you can lose 90 points in half a season. But it was like, yeah, so so far off imaginable that Fabio would lose 90 points the way he uh, the way he he rode. But I mean, it is what it is now. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited for the overseas races. Yes, yeah, same as that. I mean, the thing with um, Francesco Bagnaia. 
and this is a this is a positive as much as it's a negative. And what I'm referring to is I'm actually referring to the bad moto GP memes meme of the cycle of Francesco Bagnaia, and that he goes out of sync, gets a taste for blood, wins, gonna win the title, doesn't win the title, positive testing. You all know what I mean. You all follow the page. You know the meme I'm talking about. The thing with Bagnaia is that Bagnaia is like a shark. And when a shark tastes blood, it doesn't stop until it's got more. And that's what Banyaya is like on the Ducati. When he's gotten his taste for the win, he will win five or six. I mean, obviously he didn't win today, but he will win four or five or six races in a row until he doesn't. And he'll get not knocked out of sync again, win and continue that cycle. We're in the middle of Banyaya's really, really positive domination cycle where he will maybe not win but he will get podiums he will get second places and you are right even though i think podiums would be positive for fabio in the real world he does have to try and win these races as much as he can because he has no more leeway anymore banyai has won four races in a row very nearly won a fifth today if anything Fabio should actually be thankful to Nea Bastianini that Banyaya didn't get more points out of today. Realistically, Banyaya's title retention is still alive because Banyaya didn't win today. So Fabio has got to make the most of every opportunity he's got left. If he can, by all means, the title retaining is still on. But if not, it's hard not to see beyond Paco because his form is irresistible at the moment. Yeah, but again, Peko can't afford mistakes as well. And this that's why, that's why the third man in this conversation who gets overlooked by basically everybody comes into play, which is Elias Spiral. He's back on the podium and he is one thing he's consistent. He will take a sixth place and a sixth place is there. He will take a podium. He won't win five races in a row, but he will be there. And if either Fabio or um or Peko will do mistakes, Aleix will be there. And he has one big advantage over them, which is he had those overseas races on the MotoGP by four or 10 years or whatever. Uh, while Peko was a rookie in 2019 on a Ducati and uh, Fabio was a rookie as well. And I don't uh, see this being a negative for Alasius Bagger that he has done it so many times. And it, I believe it will be easier for him. And I can totally imagine that um, it will fuck with riders heads that they have to travel this much, be under this much uh, pressure, not from a race racing point pressure, but pressure that everything is more stressful over uh, the next two races. I mean, who had the idea of going from Aragon to Japan in one week then going one week later, I believe, is it Thailand? I believe so. Then have, yeah, then have a two-week break and then go again. Why don't you make a two-week break after Aragon? I mean, I don't get it. I mean, Dorna have a lot of incompetencies. I think we've discussed that pretty thoroughly and shone a positive light on it. But who thought this? Who thought a one-week break between Spain and Japan was a good idea. I mean, you want to do a break between Spain and Germany or something. Fair enough, I get that. But uh, seven days between thousands of miles and like three different continents. What is wrong with... Did, did Dorna not study geography at school? Did their trip planners not study the planet? I, I don't get it, but it is a stupid, stupid decision. Yeah, I mean, they went from Argentina to Indonesia in, I believe, one week. And then, which I don't, don't understand again, why don't you split the Asian races into two parts where you go like Indonesia and Thailand, and then you have three races, uh, Japan, Malaysia, and, and Australia. Why yeah. don't you make this? I mean, at least keep the races on the right side of the world. It doesn't make any sense to go from Asia to Europe to Asia to Europe. Like you said, you're absolutely right again. You know, do, for example, um, Malaysia, Thailand, Australia, and then Japan and whatever else is left. It doesn't make any sense to spread these all over the map. I mean, it's like, um, I think it was... Was it the Argentinian race where we didn't get any racing until the Saturday? 
because DHL couldn't handle it. DHL's job, DHL are the best logistics company in the world for handling massive freight. And even they couldn't handle what you asked them to do. Take the hint, Dorna. If DHL couldn't do it, you're not going to do it. Just keep it in order, for the love of God. Stop making it so difficult. Yeah. I mean, uh, back to Alej. The <laughs> one weak point of the pro year is breaking stability. I've said it all season that Alej has a problem on even Maverick too. They have a problem overtaking because the Ducati has superior braking stability and superior acceleration. And the Aprilia doesn't have the braking stability. So it's always a pain in the ass to overtake. And you saw it in Aragon again. Uh, a, Aleix was stuck into, uh, behind uh, Brad Binder. And B, he and Maverick always had problems in, into turn one. So Japan should be difficult for them. But I can totally see uh, the Aprilia working well in uh, Australia. And yeah, I mean, Malaysia is also very possible. Thailand should be more of a Ducati track. But yeah, I'm here to be surprised because uh, the last time we went there, Mark Marquez was battling with Fabio and no Ducati was near them. So yeah. But Aleish is back uh, onto the podium, had a bad couple of races where he had the injuries. I mean, he raced with a broken finger now. It was a little bit of unluck, but I can see him recovering more and in the overseas race because of his experience. And also Maverick, he had a very, very difficult weekend because for whatever reason, Aprilia didn't work for him. He had a bad qualifying and he uh, was into, uh, he was, he was held back by the uh, by the in incident between Taka and Mark Marquez. So, yeah, it's a little bit uh, difficult for Maverick at the moment, but I believe he will recover as well. He has done the overseas race also a million times. So um, I'm positive for them. And overall, Aprilia is heading in a positive direction. They have some setbacks along the way, which is completely normal, but the trajectory is up. So... Again, Maverick had a great race, uh, considering that he was basically last, and he still managed to uh, finish in the points. So, yeah, shout out to the Aprilia boys for making the best out of their situation, which uh, at least Aleix always does, and that's why he's still in the championship fight. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, definitely big shout out to Massimo Rivola and the boys over at Aprilia. Very good weekend for them. Uh, Aleish, all around solid and stable. We know this. He's the same every week. Like you said, it's why he's third in the championship race. It's why he could make up some really, really good points. And Maverick Vinales as well could have a bit to say about this title race too. I mean, these the races that we're going to are unknowns, obviously for the reasons we've just discussed. But riders like Maverick and riders like Aleish who are confident on their bike they could pick up very good points as well. I certainly wouldn't be writing anybody off at these races. The Aprilia generally seems to suit these types of tracks. I think at Phillip Island, the Aprilia will have some positive things to do there. I definitely think in Motegi, the Aprilia could do some positive stuff as well. So all around, they are having a very good uh, season so far. I think there's more points to be gained for them, absolutely. And all around, yeah, great uh, great race weekend for them and especially for Aleish. Yeah, and uh, Brad Binder somehow managed to put the KTM into the top five. I believe they found something at the Misano test, uh, not necessarily a new part, not necessarily developing for next season. They simply had to find a base setup which works for them. And it seems like that at least Brad Binder uh, has found something. And he had an incredible start. Uh, I don't know how he did that. He went from P10, I believe, to uh, second. So that's pretty good. And um, yeah, so he still didn't have the pace of the Ducatis, but who has? And uh, also over the weekend, you saw Miguel Oliveira and Remy Gardner. They're having good sessions. So KGM, I believe they found something. Will it be enough to uh, be on the podium? Who knows? But when you spend your testing day 
finding a good setup which works for you towards the end of the season it's usually a bad sign because obviously the ktm is a shit box and it doesn't necessarily help for next season you know and i don't know uh what's going on there but i don't see them being good in uh in the in the 2023 season because uh i've read a very interesting tweet uh, over the weekend which was that Miguel Oliveira and Brett Binder are the only riders who've ever been successful on the KTM and coincidentally they uh, are the only two riders who uh, rode for KTM in Model 2 and Model 3 on the steel frame I mean now it's a KTM branded team but it's a Cardex but Back in the day, it was a real KTM with a real uh, steel frame, and they did all of this. And it seems like you need to understand how this bike works. And even they can't figure it out most of the times, you know. But when they figure it out, they're good. And especially Miguel Oliveira, if he figures it out, he's a motherfucker. I mean, he can beat anybody on any given track if the circumstances are right. But Unfortunately, the KTM is a shitbox again. But those two, with the experience they have on the steel frame, is uh, yeah, they are the, the only ones who can uh, really achieve something. And that's another reason why I don't understand what the hell is going on with KTM's management there. Because uh, Remy wasn't uh, almost in the points. He for most of the race he was. Um, like in P13, uh, 14, 15, and then, uh, yeah, and then Paul Espangaro overtook him, so he ended up outside the points. He benefited hugely from the incident with Taka and Mark, but it is what it is. Sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. So, but he had a good weekend, and you see if you give them a little bit more time, those riders, and it's not just Remy. Um, you can look it up on my Instagram. I did a, a I did a post where all the all the riders who rode for KTM are buried by the KTM owners. And it's mind-boggling to me that it's that simple that you just need more time on the steel frame. With a good bike, you can do it. Um, and win races, be on the podium, be in the top five. Brad Binder and uh, Miguel Oliveira showed it. But still, they are not content with giving their riders time. And I simply don't understand it. Yeah, it's, I mean, KTM, KTM's mindset is very strange when it comes to the Premier class, I agree with you. I think this, this expectation of immediate success is just very, very strange from KTM. I mean, like you said, Miguel Oliveira and Brad Bender, only riders to ride all the way through from Moto3 and Moto2 on the stated frame and be in the premier class on it as well. And like you said, even they can't get it figured out. So how you can expect a Remy Gardner or an Agu or a um, Raul Fernandez to figure it out in half a season is ridiculous. They're never going to figure it out in half a season. They probably won't figure it out in two seasons. You've got to give riders time to get familiar with the equipment you're sending them out on. And look, you're absolutely right. When on the rare occasion that KTM get it right, they're really, really good. I mean, when, when Miguel Oliveira's setup is right, we've seen the Portimaos and the other races where he is, he looks like he's the reigning world champion in those races. He's that good. We've seen Brad Bender win races. We've seen Bla Brad Bender stay out in the rain in slicks because he's that confident in his setup and also his willingness to win, but that's another point. The point is with KTM, you've got to give these guys time. You have to. And now because of your unwillingness, you've lost your reigning Moto2 world champion to World Superbike, which I do think is actually, I'm sure we'll talk about that later, but I think it's a very good move for Remy. And you've lost the moral Moto2 champion to a rival now in RNF Aprilia. And I genuinely think Raul's going to do really good there with Miguel next year. I think that's going to be a very, very good team. So KTM not just have to don't just have to manage the bike better and find the base setup they've got to manage morale because morale's going to just keep nose diving if this is the approach they're going to keep taking so i'm interested to see what they do the rest of this this year and next season but ktm have got to get it together and soon yeah i mean i just looked it up we have remy gardner Rolf fernandez 
you don't know where their career is going to head, but I mean, Remy to a superbike with Yamaha can be a good thing. They're competitive, I believe. And uh, let's pretend uh, Yamaha brings a satellite team back. There's maybe an opportunity for Remy to go back with Yamaha. Um, Raul Fernandez heading to RNF or Pulgia, who knows how this works. I don't personally like RNF that much because I don't think that Raslan is uh, the right person and the whole team is the right thing for MotoGP, but that's just my opinion, whatever. Uh, we have Ika Legona, who's now on Superbike. Um, he was in Moto2, he was progressing, he was very, very young. They had, uh, they had given him two seasons and then he was out. Danilo Petrucci, now riding in Moto America, they had, he had one season. And now the big one, Juan Zarco, who was brought to the factory team with uh, the whole Take 3 move. And they effectively buried his career. If you maybe think now, okay, Jean Zarco is on the Premier Ducati, what are you talking about? In this season, it was, I believe, the 2018 season, if I'm not mistaken. Or I think it was. It was either 18 or 19, but it was absolutely one of the two. Yeah, I, be I believe it was 19, because 2020, he was on the Avincia Ducati. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you're right. I think it was 19. Yeah. It should have been 2019, but uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But the point I'm trying to make is he went there. He was out of the seat in the middle of the season. He had nowhere to go. Every place was filled. And he was lucky that Avincia had a place for him. And he performed so well on the, like, the least Ducati in the packing order that they promoted him to, um, to Pramac which is a very, very difficult task because if you are out of MotoGP, you're usually out. And he was out for half a season. He rolled the Honda like for one race, I believe, or two or whatever, the uh, LCR Honda. But they, his career was in real, real danger of being over. And we all know what John Zarco can do. He's a two-time world champion. Uh, he can score podiums he can't win but he can score podiums he can do basically everything except winning and he's so valuable for Ducati and they sacked him after half a season because it simply wasn't working I don't know what was going on there how much John Zarco wanted to leave but I believe they had an agreement that John, that John Zarco was good to go at the end of the season and they kicked him out in the middle of the season that's how I remember it, but I could be wrong. And then uh, Hafish Sürerin uh, wrote for KTM Tech 3. I don't know what he does now, but he isn't there anymore. He isn't in MotoGP anymore. He is not in Moto2 anymore. So those are six riders, which KTM basically ended their MotoGP career, uh, with the exception of uh, Joan Zarco, because he managed to recover. And we don't know what role is going to do but usually it's like it's like uh like it works in the nfl when you draft a rookie you're very content of letting him develop you're very um yeah you're basically that's basically your little kid you know if um ducati brings up Coco martin they will give him time to develop if uh whatever honda brings up alex marcus and Hakagami, they will give time to develop but as soon as you switch teams, it's it's not the same anymore. Um, it will take a great team, which will give you all the time in the world, but usually they expect you to perform. And if you're not performing, let's say Abro Fernandez uh, is at the bottom of the grid um, for another year, and they have like an option of signing a super talented rookie from uh, Border 2, and he doesn't have a contract for 2024, which I don't know if he has. If his manager is smart, he has a two-year contract. But uh, yeah, it's it's in danger, you know. It could it could be going wrong, which is sad because Raul is a motherfucker on a bike. Everybody seems to forget what they did last year. They were so good, nobody could touch them. Yeah. And yeah, it's very sad what KTM does. Uh, but yeah, it's the same old story. Yeah, 
It is. And, you know, you, you're absolutely correct. I mean, people forget. I think last year, perhaps with very, very few exception, Remy and Raul shared nearly every win in the Moto2 season between them last year. And you you can't just rid yourself of that talent after one season. You cannot do this. It makes no sense at all. This is a mindset problem for KTM and for Pit Byer and for the rest of the KTM team. The problem is, is that sort of in the modern world, like with a lot of things, KTM have this expectation, this completely inaccurate expectation of immediate success. We have to win and we have to win now. We have to be where Ducati are. We have to be where, to a lesser degree, Yamaha are. The problem is you're you're not going to be where they are immediately. It's it's a little bit like F1 in a way, like where you have your Red Bulls and your Mercedes and your teams like this and your McLarens. What you have to target yourself as is kind of being like the McLaren of the MotoGP grid. Target yourself as being the sort of third best manufacturer for a couple of years with a couple of exceptional young riders and then target being the likes of Ducati, then target being the likes of Yamaha. Expecting yourself to be in world title contention immediately is ridiculous. And if all you're doing is cycling through riders after every year, you're not going to win. That is not how it works. All right, Ducati is a slightly uh, jaded example. But if you look at Peko, they've given him a couple of years. He's now the, arguably the second best rider in the world bes- behind Fabio Quartararo, because I agree with you. You know, look at Yamaha. They're building the project for the next 10 years around Fabio Quartararo. They've even given Franco Morbidelli time after his horrible injury last season. The point with KTM is you've got to pick two riders whether that's Pedro Acosta in 2024 or whoever you end up picking. Yes, I, I don't want it at the moment either. Lord Pedro, stay where you are for the love of God. But the point I'm making is pick two riders, any two riders that you can get, and give them time. Give them a couple of seasons to get that bike where it needs to be. Expecting them to go out and win races immediately and get podiums is ridiculous. It isn't going to happen I can tell you that now for a fact. It isn't going to happen, KTM. The, the worst thing they did was let Remy and Raul go. Whether I mean, look, Remy is Australian, okay? He's a different way of presenting himself. He he has no sort of um, filter. That's just the way he is. I personally really like it. I know you do, but Austrians are different, okay? That's fair enough. What you should have done, KTM, if you had any sense, was keep Raul, keep Remy, Give them everything they needed for another season to get that bike where it needs to be. Now what you're going to have to do, KTM, is you're going to have to rip those pages out of that book, throw away a year's worth of work, and start again with two completely new riders. And all you've done is screw your own progress for the last year. So the point is, get two riders, be patient with them, give them the resources they need, and let them work it up that way. This expectation of immediate success is non-existent. It isn't going to happen. Yeah, and that brings me back to my point from earlier. When you compare everybody with Brad Binder and Miguel Oliveira, who had the time on the steel frame in Moto2, Brad Binder came in and won his third race. Miguel Oliveira uh, won in his second season. You know, if you if that's the um, that's the bar you're setting, you're setting yourself up for failure because when you are used to a steel frame, you can easily, not easily, but more easily, uh, develop into a good model GP riding style. But if it's a whole different world, if you come from an aluminum frame to a steel frame, everything is different. And this is like the big part which KTM seems uh, to not understand. They A, should have kept Raul in model two because he would have been uh, the short championship winner and uh, give him more time to develop. Keep Ikalik Wona and promote Remy. Then give those people time. I mean, then um, Ikalik Wona will have, uh, will have had three seasons and you could make an assumption, okay, where is his career going? What are we doing with Raul? We have him. Let's argue he wins the championship in Moto2 uh, this year if he stayed. And 
then you have a different scenario but then you don't know what's happening with Miguel. Let's say he went, uh, goes away, and then he maybe promote Raul to the factory team, whatever, you know, or Ika the Guana to the factory team. Just keep your riders, keep consistency, because this is how you de develop. If you, if you have a new girlfriend every year, you're not progressing in your relationship. You're starting all over again. You maybe learn from your mistakes. Yeah, you start a little bit higher, but you have to work on yourself if you start a new job every year you are not developing you know you have to learn things fail learn from these failures and do it better and then fail again and do it better this is how you go to the top yeah exactly you're absolutely correct and the problem is every other team in the grid has this structure well most of them have this structure in place properly and what KTM needs more than anything, more than money, more than a good bike even, they need stability. They need a foundation to build on. Your relationship example is excellent. You can relate it to your job. You can relate it to any aspect of your life. If you keep chopping and changing aspects of it every regular period, you're never going to have sustained success. You have to have a base platform that you're willing to stick with and build from there. Learn the mistakes from there. Develop from there. Get your success from there. Iker Lacona, Remy Gardner and the Tech 3 team, leave Raul and Moto 2. Give Lacona, like even last year when um, Iker Lacona was still with Tech 3, there were some qualifying sessions where Iker Lacona looked really, really good. He should have been given a chance. You know, if you keep Iker Lacona and Remy Gardner, I think you have a much better team. And it's not because of uh, Raul or anything like that. I just think you have a better mix there of experience in the MotoGP class. Then bring Raul in, promote him to the factory team if that's what you've got to do. But at least then you're creating a stable feeding system where you have riders coming in, promote from within and go in that way. Going constantly outside, bringing new people in to learn the bike. Nothing is ever going to be achieved that way because it doesn't matter. If you could bring Mark Marquez into KTM. It won't happen, but you could bring him into KTM. He would still need time to learn the bike. Fabio Quartararo would still need time to learn the bike. The fact is you have to have realistic expectations of these riders and give them the resources to succeed. Do that and you will win. Don't and you will stay where you are. That's, by the way, something uh, I would have loved to see before the whole injury thing happened. Mark Marquez is peak going to, uh, going to going to KTM, but uh, unfortunately it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, talking about KTM, I would like to switch gears and head down to Moto2 because our Lord and Savior Pedro Acosta blessed us with a masterclass. He qualified on the second row, had Albert Arenas in front of him, overtook him, had Aaron Canet in front of him, overtook him, had Jack Dixon in front of him, overtook him, and closed the gap to uh, Augusto Fernandez while battling with Aaron Canet, overtook him and went into the distance. He was a very mature in those situations where you didn't know what was going on in a reverse corkscrew because of the Zonta crash. He was very careful and he always managed to stay in touch with his competitors without being reckless. That's the uh, thing a rookie could possibly do in this situation. He was very mature then. And when he uh, saw the daylight, he went off. And he was very, very good. And I would argue he's still not at 100% after his leg break. He's close to it, but he's not at 100%. And I'm very, very happy with this performance. And it shows again that you just need time to develop on a Moto2 bike. And he was a motherfucker today. He was so good. And what surprised me, he was so fast in the, on the straight. He was overtaking everybody basically on straight. He was so, so good. And that's just the talent that he is. The good structure that Aki Ayo has. He is perfect where he is right now. I'm very excited for next year to see him develop. I'm very excited again for the overseas races because in Moto2, basically everybody is a rookie on those uh, tracks. I believe Augusto Fernandez has some experience there, but uh, that's basically it. Ayogura hasn't, uh, Aaron Canet hasn't, Tony Avellino hasn't, 
you know, Acosta has it, Abadarinos has it, you know, those guys running at the front, Samuel has, so that should be fun. But um, he's coming back from injury, so I'm very excited again for the Odyssey races. But uh, in Aragon, Pedro convinced me he was so good, and I'm very, very happy for him. Wow, what a brilliant performance from Pedro Acosta. There is no other way to say it. It was out of this world brilliant from our Lord and Saviour, especially at the Balmoto GP memes organization, Lord Pedro Pitley and Acosta. It was brilliant from beginning to end. It really, really was. And I did have confidence that Pedro could pull off something like this. I don't think I quite saw him winning, but I absolutely, every day of the week, I saw a podium. And he exceeded what I thought he would do. He really did. Like you said, on the straights, he looked like he was just flying past everybody else. I mean, he just, he just flew past everybody. Augusto, Ayagora, everybody left them in his wake. He really, really did. And what impressed me the most about Pedro today isn't even the overtaking, not even the getting past everybody, although it was brilliant. It was that maturity that you referred to towards the end of the race to open up that, I think it was a three second gap by the end of the race, to open up that gap and maintain the distance and keep your composure. I mean, Pedro Acosta is a world champion for a reason because he's only, I think he's only 18 now, if I'm not wrong. I know he was 17 last year. You know, he's 18 years old and he's doing this to a very experienced Moto2 grid. I mean, when Pedro Acosta's on form on that bike, he could win that championship. That's how good he is. I mean, I think he will absolutely be champion next year. I think this year was always data gathering and getting used to the bike. But wow, he was so, so impressive today. Massive hats off to Pedro Acosta because he was the best. There is no other way of saying it. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you consider all the time that he missed... And uh, the races in the beginning of the season, which were a learning experience, but he crashed quite a bit. If you take those races together and say, like, on average, he scores in the top five, he could say something in a championship. He maybe wouldn't be leading right now, but he uh, certainly would be in the top three, top four. Oh, yeah, he would. I believe he's 120 something points down. Math mathematically, he still has a chance to win, I believe, but um, whatever. No, but uh, that's that shouldn't be the point. Next season will be the season where we talk about championships, uh, which uh, should be rather interesting because we have Celestino Lietti, who stays in order to who has been brilliant this season and has been catastrophic this season. And if he, it's still his uh, second season, so if he sorts the mistakes out and finishes the races instead of crashing, Cinecini Vietti will be uh, a dangerous man. Ayogura will stay. He will be a dangerous man, especially if he figures out how to qualify on the front row consistently. Aaron Canet will be a dangerous man because he can win, even though he doesn't, but he can win. And uh, whoever gets the second Red Bull KTM IO seat will be a championship contender. And it's sad, it's rumored that it's uh, going to be Albert Arenas. I always, uh, I always uh, thought they would bring up Fabio Masia, but he stays in his model three and continues the Fabio Masia cycle of going from KTM to Honda to KTM to Honda. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, but um. I'm very happy with Pedro. And regarding the championship, uh, Fernandez looked for the most part like he was uh, off for a big win in the championship. But Ayurura did uh, some serious damage limitation and Augusto Fernandez dropped uh, down the packing order, which uh, resulted in a positive result for Ayurura, I would assume. And again, OC races, everybody basically, the rookie should be fun. So, uh, yeah. Um, I'm very excited for the championship as well. It's very tight. And yeah, let's see how much Peter will help or hinder Augusto Fernandez from winning the championship. Yeah, it's very interesting to see. It really is. I mean, look, Moto2 is already shaping up to be very, very exciting next year. I'm really looking forward to it. 
like you said, a lot of our stars of this season are going to be there next year. And we're going to see them with experience from this year, with experience on their bikes. And it's going to be very, very fun to see who is able to take it out of the bag. I think it will be. That's my very, very early prediction. I do think it will be Pedro because I think to be 18 and doing what he does already, all the roads point to pit lane Pedro as far as I'm concerned. All signs point to the pit lane. Um, all around, I just think I think Moto2 is in such a good organic spot right now that I just think we are in such a good position with them. I don't think there's any rush in sending them straight up to MotoGP. I think keep them there for a couple of years. Let them fight it out. Let them have these great races and these great championships. And all around, I think it's going to be very, very interesting, especially with Pedro, to see what impact he can have on everybody else. We have the new Johan Zarco, Aaron Canet, who is always there but doesn't seem to be quite able to win. We have Ayagora Chantra. You know, we've got all these guys who will be there next year, and I'm very excited to see how it unfolds. Even Alonso Lopez as well, who had a very unfortunate crash today. But he's been such a brilliant addition to the championship. He's been so much fun to watch. And all around, I am very excited for next year. Yeah, I mean, who would blame Ayogura for seeing this shitbox of the Honda and the new sprint racing format? Uh, and not wanting to go to MotoGP. I wouldn't. I mean, if I was Augusto Fernandez, I would probably stay in uh, Moto2, but yeah, it is what it is. And uh, I mean, at least let it be a good fight. If I was offered a Ducati, I would go there. But if I was offered a KTM or a Honda, I would stay in Moto2. Why would I, why would I change it? I mean... Wait for a good offer because you've seen all the failed careers in MotoGP due to a bad bike, you know. And um, yeah, also Cimizzi Novietti, he had a difficult weekend, crashed again in qualifying, had a tough race battling with Barry Baltos. Who would have thought? And uh, yeah, I mean, he still needs time to develop. He still needs time to mature, which is fine. It's still the second season, so... I don't mind them staying in uh, staying in Moto Two. Yeah, um, it's unfortunate about Celestino because I think one of us had him as winning the title this year. It might have been me. No, we had both Pedro and uh, winning the title because of oh, the, fair enough. the tests in Forty Mile, where he set the all-time lap record during his test. But I had Celestino Vietti as the surprise of the year. Ah, uh, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Uh, I mean, look, it's unfortunate for Celestino. He's had, for the large part, a great season. He really, really has. Unfortunately, he had that first crash and he just hasn't really recovered his confidence or his momentum at all. And, you know, he was leading the championship at one point, and now he is just at sea, unfortunately. Our overlord and saviour, Valentino, is looking down on him from the memes, of course. Uh, you know, um, it is what it is. But, yeah, I I do look forward to seeing Chalicino next year. I think he will be better. But it's, it is a shame to see him throw it away because he is worth – he is championship worthy. He really is. On his day, he can dominate a race – it's just unfortunate the way things have panned out, but he will learn from it. Yeah, sure. Let's hope. And uh, yeah, regarding championship battles, I feel like Sergio Garcia isn't mentally tough enough to win a championship. Mm -hmm. I said it last year when he was battling with Pedro, because when Pedro had those difficult races in Silverstone, he crumbled and had a bad pumps as well, where this was his time to uh, to shine, where Pedro had the crash in uh, Aragon, he crashed as well, you know, and I thought, okay, maybe he needs just a year, and at the beginning of the season, he looked so good, but right now, with the fuck-ups in, uh, with the fuck-ups in Zano, and his problems in uh, Aragon now, we had a couple of mistakes, bad qualifying, all of this, you know, it looks like Sergio Garcia is an exceptional rider, but some Maverick vibes are there, you know, where when things get serious, he starts to, I don't like to say crumble under the pressure, but, you know, he's he makes more mistakes. And now Isan Guevara, who's like the second uh, Falkland Lorenzo, or like the third Falkland Lorenzo after Pekka Banyaya, 
when he gets in front, he is gone. He is so incredibly good. I can't put it into words because Model Three is not a not a class where you where you're supposed to get a 10 second lead over the guys who didn't finish on the podium. You know, it's mind boggling how fast Ivan Guevara was. And and Danny Algado and who was it Ayuma Zanaki were only able to keep up with him because of the slipstream. You know how much this makes in uh, Model 3. And they wasn't they weren't able to touch him. They were just able to stay with him. Like this gap where you get like four tenths in the slipstream and then you lose him again in the corners, then you gain him back. You know, they were playing this kind of game. And at the end, Ethan, he was gone. Nobody could do anything. It was so, so impressive. And uh, yeah, I can see him winning the title now because, but again, the overseas races are a big as World Cup, especially in Moto3. Yeah, I mean, I actually think in terms of all the classes, arguably the most exciting X factor in terms of the wildcard races will actually be their impact on Moto3 because, look, pretty much any guy from the top 10 in Moto3 has come through the Rookies Cup. They've come through these programs and they know these tracks like the back of their hand. They've raced them since they were probably young teenagers. They know these tracks like nobody else does. But these overseas tracks, the Motegis, the Thailands, the Phillip Islands, these will be big game changers. Because like you said, nobody's ridden on them before. So it will be very, very exciting to see. First of all, big congratulations to Izan Guevara. Another fantastic race. He is the king of Spain. I think all his wins this season have come on Spanish territory. I mean, the, the kid is just unbelievable. He is so fast. On that straight, he just flies away from everybody. It's unbelievable. But he is very, very impressive. i I got to give him props. He is so good. Sergio Garcia, I do feel a little bit sorry for, but I think you're also correct. I think there are some riders who thrive under pressure, and there's some riders who it just gets to them. And that's human nature. Some of us deal with pressure really well. Some of us have difficulty coping with it. I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think that's the way it is. I do put Dennis Foggia in that same bracket as Sergio Garcia. And that when almost like when the limelight is firmly on them in a title race, it seems to affect them differently. I think there's some riders like your Foggias, like your Sergio Garcias, who almost perform better as underdogs when the focus isn't on them. They feel pressure-free to go and ride their best race. Whereas I feel with riders like Isan Guevara, they do have a certain mentality where they thrive on the spotlight and they thrive on the pressure and they thrive in the moment, most importantly. So realistically, Izan Guevara is a big, big favourite for the title now because I do think that pressure does not affect him the way it affects the others. But these overseas races, they they will be the telling factor because it's an even playing field when it comes to them. Yeah, I mean, Izan Guevara is, for me, a little bit like Jose Antonio Rea. If he's in front, he's gone. Nobody can touch him. But if you disrupt his rhythm, you can uh, you can beat him, you know? And that's basically what Sandra Garcia and what uh, Dennis Foggia have to do. But unfortunately, they're riding around in 13th and 14th position. So I don't know what was going on with Dennis Foggia. He won there last year. He wasn't able to uh, do anything this year. And he didn't have the pace for whatever reason. It was gone. And uh, it seems like he doesn't want to win the title. Sounds stupid, but yeah. But again, the overseas races, he has a race there, the experience is there. He was good in uh, in Indonesia, which was a new track for everybody. He was good in Qatar. You know, maybe he has to be able uh, to feel like a little advantage over the others. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Last year, he thrived uh, under the pressure of being down in the championship. This year, uh, he crumbles onto it. I don't know what the hell is going on there. But um, yeah, still, I believe if you can disrupt Ivan Guevara's rhythm and 30 points in Model 3 is nothing. It's like anything can happen, especially with five races left. And those races, 
it's so chaotic. You can be 12th in one lap like David Munoz and finish like seventh or something. Um, which brings us to the next topic, <laughs> which is the several attempted murder cases of David Munoz this season. And he received the long lap penalty for uh, overtaking Adrian Fernandez, where there wasn't a gap. And he basically said, this is my corner now. If you are lucky, you stay on the bike, but that's your fucking problem, not mine. And Adrian Fernandez luckily stayed on the bike. He had a big ass wobble, and unfortunately, there was a um, there was an asphalt runoff area where he could uh, recover the bike. But if there was uh, gravel or grass, no chance. And to me, David Munoz is an exceptional rider. He's so good. What he does on a motorcycle is very very impressive. But his brain is that of a like a toddler who only is happy if he gets what he wants. It seems like he he's just, okay, I want this position. If I get it, okay, cool. But if I not, I will take it from here. And no matter what, he doesn't think ahead. He's like a four-year-old or whatever, or a three-year-old. I don't know. I don't have children. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but to me, race direction has to do something about it because it's not about when something happens, when he crashes into somebody and somebody injures themselves. It's about to prevent those things. And when you have overtaking maneuvers like those from uh, David Munoz against Adria Fernandez, or he had a couple of overtakes where you were like, ah, we are lucky this went well, um, you have to punish him. And I would like to see a penalty system. I mean, I like the penalty system with the long lap penalties, but I would like to have a penalty system based on points where you have, um, for example, a track limits violations is one. If you make a dangerous overtake like David Munoz, for example, did, and uh, you, you almost take somebody out, but it somehow it's good, you get three penalty points, for example. Or then you have a situation where you make somebody crash, like, oh God, I don't have an example right there. Like, like Taka Nakagami did in Mugello with Alex Rins. Let's say this one. This is like a five point, and then you say five points is a um, is a long life penalty. So, for example, if you have one dangerous overtake and two um, two here two uh, track limits violations, then you get a long life. And then if you take somebody out, uh, they crash in you too. Like for example, Taka did in uh, Catalonia. You get like 10 points, which is a double long lap. And then you go ahead and say, if you're a repeated offender, let's say David Munoz, who does this shit constantly, you multiply those um, those points. For example, when you do it the first time, cool, mistake happens. But if you do the same thing again, next race or in the same race, you get double the points. You know, so two dangerous overtakes which uh, David Munoz did on six penalty points, they are nine penalty points because you get three for the first one, six for the second. And then you add those penalty points up and you can reduce like the double penalty, penalty um, when you are for a certain time, let's say you erase it if you're good for two races or three races. If you're clean for three races, you erase the double um, penalty point system, you know? And therefore, you eliminate, uh, eliminate, first of all, the stupid track limit violation points in the last lap. Because if it happens in the last lap, you just get a point and it's good. And if you accumulate it over time, you get, um, you get a long lap. Maybe this is a more progressive way of penalizing riders. And then when you go like multiple times taking somebody out that you get a race ban or grid penalties or whatever, but have some structure there and not just do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's an excellent proposal. And I mean, like I'm not expecting Dorna to do it because Dorna don't have any brain cells as we've covered many, many times. But I think that's a brilliant idea. We need a different punishment system for riders. And look, I'll cover David Munoz before I continue with the punishment system proposal. You just can't do that, David. You cannot do I mean, we have talked about this many, many times on many different forums about Moto3 
I mean, look, Mo- MotoGP is a dangerous sport as it is. But with Moto3, we can even see fatalities at times. And look, I don't like using Jason DePasquier's name lightly because, of course, it was an absolute travesty what happened. And I hope he is eternally resting in peace wherever he is, young Jason DePasquier. But these are the risks that we run with in our sport. And you cannot just push your way through whenever you feel like it. There are consequences for other riders. Thankfully, Adrian Fernandez somehow kept his bike up, but you can't just push your way through. You cannot do this, Davi. You cannot. And look, you know, I do agree with your point about his brain as well. I think David Munoz is a brilliant young rider, championship worthy rider. But I think his brain has a little chimp riding around on a unicycle, wearing a fez and clapping cymbals together sometimes. I think that is basically his brain when he's on that bike. And look, you got to leave that shit at the door because this sport is dangerous, okay? And look, I'm not saying you have to give up every position that another rider's in. I expect you to go in and I expect you to fight. But I expect you to have the basic common sense to know when it's safe to move and when it isn't. I mean, Adrian Fernandez at best could have crashed out earlier today at worst he could have suffered a serious injury and you have to be considerate of other riders around you david because these things do happen to people we do have bad injuries we do have fatalities it's happened to riders better than you it's happened to riders more experienced than you so you got to keep it in mind and you got to cut that shit out because it will not fly simple as as for the punishment system I really like your thinking, Leo. I mean, we've talked about this before uh, and that this is what we would implement. And it's definitely what I would implement as well. I think we need an overhaul of the punishment system. I think an accumulation of points throughout the race is a very good idea. If you get something like three points, um, you do whatever punishment, you get a second taken off your time. You get six points accumulated from various violations. You do a long lap. You get nine points, you do whatever. And then I think if you get to something like 12 points or 15 points, you start from the pit lane in the next race. We have to have a variation of punishments and we almost have to start judging these offences almost as legal cases in that we have to judge them according to the offence and according to the context around them in that is this person a serial offender on the track? If this person's a first-time offender, like say it's um, Kubo, for example, then fair enough, be lenient. But if it's someone like David Munoz who does this every single race weekend, you have to punish them more stringently because it's going to end up getting away from us at a point where we cannot punish people anymore for what they're doing. And we've got to be more stringent with it. So my point is I very much agree with you. And I think this is something that should be implemented. Yeah, I mean, I'm sick of talking about it, but apparently we have to, because uh, if you haven't listened to the Joel Kelso podcast, I can highly recommend it because he talked about it as well. Um, he said things like that uh, people who died, who didn't even want to be there because their parents forced them to be in there. We were talking about the whole age limit thing. And so it's uh, very interesting, but I'm sick of talking about it, but I can't because David Munoz, for example, every time he steps on a motorcycle, puts somebody's health in danger. We saw it today with Takanakagami and Mark Marquez. These things happen, and I believe Taka had the injured uh, right hand. I don't know, but yeah, it's it, it actually started to interrupt. It was released earlier by Taka. His right hand's in a cast. So I don't know how severe the injury is, but it is pretty serious somewhere along the line. So just to add some information on that. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the picture where he's in the car with the uh, cast yeah. in the hand, but I don't know what exactly the injury is. But the point is you don't wear something like this if everything's fine, you know? And uh, things like these happen even on a, let's say, a mild crash like Takahed or Alex Rins uh, was injured in Catalonia. You know, those things unfortunately happen and it's not like we're in a fairy tale world where everything is fine those riders are putting the health on the line. it doesn't always have to be the death of somebody which is the worst case scenario and i would like to never see it again but unfortunately it's part of the sport which is like the worst part of the sport but it, it is part of the sport 
and then uh, you have like those normal injuries, I would say, um, which, for example, let's say it happens to uh, it happens to Isen Guevara, it happens to Cedric Garcia. Those championship uh, championships are effectively over, and you risk not only their health but also their long term career because. What if they don't win the championship because of your stupid maneuver and they uh, lose sponsorship money, whatever. You, you could severely impact the, the way someone's career is going with an injury like this. Or look at the Mark Marcus situation. Assume you take somebody out and they injure themselves like Mark Marcus, their, their career, if their name is not Mark Marcus, is over. I mean, if Mark Marcus hadn't won eight championships before and had the exact same injury, he would have been retired right now. Hondo yeah. would have taken him, uh, him back. Nobody else would have taken him back. He's only there because he's that good. But unfortunately, not everybody is that good. And it's it's like a huge problem, which riders like Takanakarami had at the beginning of the season where he was taking uh, riders out recklessly. Uh, David Munoz has this every single race. Moto3 in general has a problem. But they somehow can't seem to fix it. And they need to do something. Unfortunately, the D in Dorna stands for them. And they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And we can't change a thing because they're not only dumb, they're also ignorant. And yeah, I mean, it's it's a sad topic. I hate to talk about it. But I have to talk about it, or we have to talk about it, because of dumbasses like David Munoz. And I don't know what they can do to uh, to prevent him from doing this shit, except penalizing him hard. Yeah. I mean, look, there is no other alternative to this. There just isn't. What's becoming clear is that talking and public criticism aren't enough they're not deterring riders from this kind of stupid, ignorant behavior when they're riding. That's That much is clear. So then you have to go to the next step, which is punishing severely, because this kind of stuff has to be stomped out. And again, you're right. You know, it's not even just, um, you know, obviously health is the most important thing. I'm certainly not saying otherwise. But riders' livelihoods are also affected by your ignorance and your non-riding as well sponsorships are gone you know from helmets leathers all that kind of stuff commercial income is gone from your team from your employer the problem is is that a lot of these young riders are so desperate to stand out make an impression that they're taking bigger and bigger and bigger risks in order to try and win and look i have no problem with hard racing we both love hard racing overtakes all that kind of stuff but i do not want people's health unnecessarily put at risk because that is too much of a risk it's kind of like um it's kind of like nicky lauda used to say whenever he raced for ferrari in the 70s when i race i take a certain percentage of acceptance that i might crash and die but no more than that and i am of that mindset you should not be pushing the boundary of risk any more than you should be and that includes dumbass riding dangerous non-regard for fellow riders amongst everything else the fact is these kids like davin munoz don't get me wrong i think davin munoz is a really good kid and i certainly don't think he intends to hurt anybody but you've got to be more intelligent when you're riding or we will have more fatalities that's where this will end and then you have to ask yourself how many more must happen before Dorna does something. The fact is there has to be punishment. It has to come in now and we have to see this stamped out or else we're in a really bad place. Yes. I would like to end uh, this episode with uh, one of my favorites, favorite quotes of myself, which is uh, if you don't, lo- um, if you no longer go for a gap that doesn't exist, you're no longer that Munoz. so so with this one uh, I would like to close this chapter and close off the episode it has been fun we see each other next week after Japan I'm very excited what the OVC races will bring and I can't wait for it except for the uh, getting up early I hate doing this so uh, yeah 
see uh, see you again in one week. Hopefully you all enjoyed the episode. See ya. Bye everybody. See you on the other side of Japan. <laughs> <laughs>